I think that both components of truth and reconciliation are really important. So in order to achieve truth and reconciliation, we need to first start with truth. And that's been a really difficult thing in the education system in Canada. Um, I think that in previous generations and even up till now, people have been robbed of the opportunity to learn about the sophistication of the intellectual traditions of the First Peoples of what is now Canada. Um, and they've also been robbed of a full understanding of the entire history of the country in which they live. Um, that's problematic on a number of fronts because it creates a national mythology that's not reflective of the diversity of our history. And so when we concentrate only on Canada's achievements, which shouldn't be understated, we, we've a lot of great things have happened in this country, but there's also been really what can be classified as a genocide. And in order to, to fully understand the country in which we live, we need to understand that history as well. At the same time, we can't stop education on Indigenous issues with just focusing on residential schools because in the millennia of, um, of time that our ancestors have been on this land, they've developed intellectual tradition that is reflective of knowledge that's connected to the land um, and that is deep and wise and comparable to any intellectual tradition around the world. And so by robbing students of the ability to understand that and, and the opportunity to really get into that, um, we're robbing them of a fulsome knowledge of the place where they live. Um, and I think that that is as detrimental to Indigenous students and not, uh, as it is to non-Indigenous students. Um, and so that's where teachers have a responsibility to educate themselves since they probably didn't have the opportunity previously. Um, so they need to embark on a journey of education in truth, both with respect to the Canadian state as well as the realities of Indigenous life in the past and in the present in Canada. Um, then we get to reconciliation. And I think that's where, um, for me in my classes, I turn to the medicine wheel. And so we need to know we need to know the truth, but we also really need to understand that and understand the implications um, that, the past have ha that the past has on life today. And then we need to know what we have to do and we need to know how we can honor that. And that, to me, in education, is guiding students to recognize their biases and recognize their privileges and recognize their own histories so that we can create a more equitable state for everyone in the future. I think that Indigenous knowledge is diverse and vast and deep. Um, it's, it's intimately connected to land. And so because, because our people have been here since time immemorial, they have developed knowledge that is reflective of the land on which we live. And I think that there's a tremendous beauty to that. Um, one thing that I I'm confronted with in my work uh, is the preconception that Indigenous knowledge only fits into history and social studies, maybe fine arts, and that our people didn't have science. But I actually find it easiest to source resources that connect to the sciences and resources that connect to, um, yeah, to, we've got literature and we've got all of the subjects, but it's not, it's not encapsulated in that way. So for me, Indigenous knowledge is intrinsically holistic which means that rather than focusing on compartmentalized knowledge in subjects, rather Indigenous knowledge is focused on the relationship between those subjects, right? So um, say I'm going to study a topic, which is the Great Lakes. And in studying the topic that is the Great Lakes, I can learn water songs and I can connect that to music. I can learn about fluid dynamics and how the water flows from Lake Superior through Niagara Falls and down into Lake Ontario and how we're all connected through that water. I can learn about the biology of the water. I can learn about the stories that our people have told and the existing literature, whether it be sacred stories or personal stories about that water. Um, and I can learn about the social impacts of it as well and the history and how it, how it reflects social studies. So all of those things can be learned through that topic. But in addition to that, I think I also need to practice what Marie Batiste called a spirited epistemology where I honor that and I honor the spirituality that's connected to it because that's also an intrinsic part of Indigenous knowledge. It's deeply spiritual and it's relational and it enriches our communities through those ways as well as just through the intellectual. So I think for me, it 
comes back to the dish with one spoon wampum and what we can learn from that. And the dish with one spoon teaches us that we all have the right to the dish. We all have the right to the spoon, but not too much. We don't have the right to take to the point that other people don't have the opportunity to get what they need. And I love learning about the history of Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people on this land because our ancestors engaged the land so differently because Haudenosaunee were engaged in agriculture and Anishinaabe were engaged in hunter-gathering. Often those two are portrayed as very divergent ways of living and often hunter-gathering is portrayed as something lesser than agriculture, but actually they're just different ways of engaging territory. And if we hadn't been engaging it in different ways, we wouldn't have been able to share it. But because we, we stewarded the land in different ways, I don't know if steward is the right word, but we engaged the land in different ways and our cultures reflected that. That's what allowed for the sharing. It was the diversity that was the key to the success of shared territory. Um, what I love about it today is the diversity and the compassion that it teaches me. Um, so I see and I feel in myself the love of Anishinaabe culture and I love Anishinaabe spirituality and so because of that I love Longhouse for Haudenosaunee people. Right? It's not mine but I understand how special and important it is and I can love diverse ways of, of thinking that settlers and newcomers have brought as well because I have that love of my own culture and so respect imbues us with compassion um, and I think that that's a real message that, I, that shared territory can teach us in a really unique way. It's not about borders, it's about what do we owe each other and how do we engage with the places that we are in ways that are respectful to other, people, other people's ways of being. Well, working with teacher candidates is one of the most joyful things in my life because I really do see their potential to make positive change. Um, so I think that they need to take it upon themselves to become educated and to become allies if they're a non-Indigenous person. If they're a person of Indigenous heritage, I think it's really important that you make that known. Um, and that means going on a journey sometimes of discovery, of knowing exactly who your ancestors are and how you relate to Indigenous community. Uh, and that can be a really long and difficult journey, uh, depending on, on who your ancestors are and, and how that has played out in your life. Um, or it can be something that is acknowledging a really deep part of yourself that's always been there. But I think it's very important that teacher candidates and teachers who are Indigenous self-identify to their students uh, because it's important that people first of all realize that Indigenous people express their indigeneity in a lot of different ways and that Indigenous people look really diverse um, and that Indigenous people can occupy roles of authority and roles of education. So that comes back to role modeling, right? And it comes back to an understanding of the diversity of indigeneity in Canada. Uh, so that's something that, that I always encourage is that people are open about their heritage and that they ensure that they've done the research to claim it properly and to express it properly. Um, I think Thomas King, I love how he puts it in his Massey lecture, um, something along the lines of, uh, don't pretend that in the years to come, if you had heard the story, you would have lived your life differently. You've heard it now. And so it's fine to not know, but it's not fine to stay in a place of ignorance. <laughs>